stand up South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a COVID thing. A very good morning, Africa Zonga, Africa and the world. My name is Titus Tungu, and this is the EFF podcast. And of course, we're coming to you from the revolutionary house, Winnie Madigzela Mandela House. On today's episode, I'll be joined in studio by advocate uh, Dali Mpofu, who is one of the most important figures in South Africa's political and uh, legal fraternity advocate, uh, Dali Tolo. And both uh, joins me now in studio. A very good morning to you and welcome. Yes, good morning to you, uh, Fighter Titus. Yeah. And uh, your viewers. Indeed. Mm. And uh, Dali Tolo, you are mostly known as uh, Dali. Why do you prefer Dali over Dali Tolo? Well, no, I don't. I actually like my full name. Oh, okay. It's people who preferred to call me Dali. Actually, it started when I was still at school. Okay. And then it just stuck. I suppose it's a shortening of the name. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, yeah, no, Dalukolo is, uh, which is the name I was given by my parents, is a beautiful name. Ah, uh, it is. Because it means uh, the one who creates peace. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Kolo is peace in, in my home language. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that uh, I'm, it's a name that I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. And you are affectionately uh, known as, um, uh, you know, Dali Mpofo, or the People's Advocate, mm -hmm. in fact. But let's pack that for now. Yes. Uh, perhaps if you can give us a glimpse of the most unpopular side of you, mm -hmm. who is uh, Advocate Dali Mpofo? Well, um, Dalimpofu is um, a simple guy, mm -hmm. you know, the son of a domestic worker, uh, grew up in relative poverty yeah, mm -hmm. in the Eastern Cape, uh, was born in a place called Duncan Village, um, but grew up both in the townships and also in the rural areas, mm -hmm. uh, alternately which was uh, a blessing in disguise because I, when I grew up, I was able to understand both rural and urban life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, then from there, I did fairly well at school, I must say. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, then I was able to go into higher education, which was um, interrupted by the political involvement. I was yeah. involved politically at, a, at quite a young age. So that at the age of 17, I was already, was my first, tasted my first arrest wow. under, under detention. Um, went to work, literally, mm -hmm. after that. After we went through a trial, and after the trial, I went to work in a factory in, mm -hmm. in East London. Yeah. And I was uh, manufacturing cars in oh. that factory. So you were born in the Eastern Cape? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then... Um, yeah, from there, decided to go back to school after that, uh, after like a second detention yeah. uh, without trial. And again, did well and managed to get a scholarship to VITS, uh, which then brought me into student politics yeah. uh, and into UDF, mm -hmm. ANC, until the yeah. times of the EFF, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Dalimpov is a very humble son of a, of a domestic worker. Wow, well, yeah. Um, yeah, and a, a family person. Yeah, and indeed you do look humble. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Even yeah. when you're in court. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes. You're talking about being a, a son of a domestic worker. Mm. Uh, perhaps if we can just look at um, your personal life. Mm. Um, are you a family man? Are you married? Uh, do you have children and all that? Yes, I'm, I'm married. Mm -hmm. I actually have four children, uh, three sons and okay. a, a daughter. My mm -hmm. daughter is the last born, so she's very spoiled. She's okay. a daddy's girl. <laughs> yeah. little girl. But she's also <laughs> a member of the EFF Student Command at oh. the UCT. Okay. Um, and um, yes, so yeah, I'm uh, married and mm -hmm. my wife... Uh, 
works for one of the parastate ads. Yeah. Okay. You are quite a busy person. Mm. Um, even this morning, uh, before we started this podcast, you yeah. were going through a lot of papers. Yes. <laughs> How do you find a perfect balance between your work and um, a personal life or being a father? It's quite difficult, I must say, because remember, I have three professions. Yeah, that mm-hmm. of being a father in the, in the family, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, quite a lot. Uh, being an advocate and senior counsel in uh, mm-hmm. a very uh, difficult and quite complex matters. Yeah. Uh, as well as being an activist of the EFF yes. and at some stage a leader of the EFF. Mm-hmm. So to find a balance between those three lives, mm-hmm. as it were, uh, it's, it's quite challenging because all of them have their own demands. Mm-hmm. Um, but I suppose what makes one to survive, because every day of my life people ask me, how do you make it? How do you survive? How do you balance? And yes, how do yes. you actually work around this? And I think that what drives me is really the passion because uh, all of those things are things that are close to my life. And yeah. Particularly the politics and the and the legal side, mm-hmm. for me it's the same thing because I don't think there's you can mm-hmm. have um, a that you can separate law from politics as it were. Yeah, and um, absolutely. And 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 in in a way, justice the, mm-hmm. the whole thing is a quest for justice. Whether you do it in a courtroom or mm-hmm. on the street while you are marching. It's the same thing, really, to try and get justice for as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about your profession as an advocate. Uh, You served as the at the judicial judicial service commission from 2017. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you may help us understand the role of this institution, Mm -hmm. and uh, would you say it can be used as an instrument for uh, social justice? Oh, yes. Uh, properly handled, it could be used as an instrument for social justice. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm lucky. I always say that I've probably played every single yeah. role that is possible in a in the legal system. Yes. I've been a, an accused person. I've been a, you know, a, a inmate in the yeah. correctional <laughs> services. And the legal uh, representative. Yes, I've been a yeah. lawyer. I've been yeah. an acting judge. Mm-hmm. I've been... Uh, now I'm even a private prosecutor in some of the cases yeah. that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so uh, to be a member of the JSC was just completing that cycle mm-hmm. because that's a very important institution in our democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why even its composition is determined in the constitution itself that there'll be so many people who represent mm-hmm. this one and so on. Normally th- those kinds of details are left to either legislation or, mm-hmm. or delegated legislation. But the constitutional drafters saw it uh, sufficient or, 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 or necessary yeah. to, to prescribe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's because ours is a constitutional democracy and the custodians of the constitution mm-hmm. are, the, are the judges, as mm-hmm. it were, mm-hmm. because they their job is to interpret the constitution, give life to it. And um, as a, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important institution. Mm-hmm. So if we appoint the wrong judges who, who don't subscribe to the values of the constitution, then we can't expect them to police the constitution on yeah. our behalf, as it were. So yeah, it was a, it's a very important institution, and um, there's a lot of improvement that can be done there okay. to make sure that um, you know who is scrutinized. Because once a judge is appointed, it's mm-hmm. an appointment for life. There's nothing you can do yeah. after that. Yeah. Okay. So you have to make double sure that you have got the the correct people there. So through the eye of the uh, needle, you make sure that you you appoint uh, you know judges who are ethical. And uh, we've, we've got uh, the interest of the people at heart. Mm. Uh, in your experience uh, as a member of the JSC, uh, would you say there have been judges that were appointed uh, whom that you, re- you regret at the moment, the appointment? Oh, certainly. There's no system that is perfect. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, I think some people go through uh the what was supposed to be the eye of the needle uh, <laughs> yeah uh, by, so maybe the 
uh, is the eye of the needle is too wide, yeah. Yeah. Um, so inevitably that would happen. But I would say by and large, I think that uh, we tested for competency. Mm -hmm. So you could say by and large, we probably appointed the best of the crop. So yeah. if the crop was, was bad itself, yeah. then there's nothing you can do because those posts have to be filled. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if we may just look uh, back, uh, you recommended uh, a Justice uh, Mandi Samaya to become the Chief Justice, but to the contrary, the President appointed uh, Chief Justice Raymond Zond. What are the powers and limitations of uh, JSC? Uh, because um, you recommended mm. this judge, but uh, ultimately at the end, uh, the candidate that was recommended by JSC was not the one who became the Chief Justice. Yeah, look, I wouldn't like to comment much on that because there's some serious litigation around it. And mm -hmm. obviously, that's actually the reason why I cannot even be directly involved in that yeah. litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, although I've been asked to to advise uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on kind of the non-legal aspects of it. Simply because I was sitting, I was involved in the in the in the JC at the time. Okay. But if you if one talks it talks generally. Yes. Um, it's it's quite simple actually. The, the there are two regimes. One involves uh, the appointment of a chief justice and a, a deputy chief justice. Mm -hmm. In that instance, the president has a legal obligation to consult the JSC okay. and uh, leaders of political parties. Mm -hmm. In the appointment of ordinary judges or other judges, then. Uh, he must take the advice. It's a that's what the constitution says yes. of the of the of the JC. Mm -hmm. So, in my belief, in both cases, he cannot just wake up and appoint you or me yeah. or me. Sure. Uh, because otherwise, what's the point of saying that there must be consultation? Mm -hmm. Because the consultation is consultation. It's not just going through. It's not like informing someone. Mm -hmm. When you consult someone, you must take their views yeah. on board. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, um, I, I think those will be unpacked when the current litigation, because as you know, um, uh, President Zuma and the Jacob Zuma Foundation are challenging mm -hmm. or asking the courts to set aside that appointment mm -hmm. exactly on the on the basis of uh, whether or not uh, one of the issues is, a, is yeah. what you are asking, whether or not he, he was free yeah. to simply ignore the JSC okay. uh, Stance yeah, that. you know, once uh, legal people say the matter is subjudicated, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're not going it's to the, change. the best escape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But mm. in your view, uh, uh, Deputy, uh, rather uh, Justice Raymond Zondo, is now the Chief Justice, mm. and uh, he has uh, been perceived as someone who has descended uh, the political arena. Uh, he has made public comment on. Um, the fate of uh, uh, pres former President Jacob Zuma on whether he should be prosecuted or not. He said, well, if uh, the NPA has enough uh, evidence, sure, it can go ahead and prosecute former uh, President Jacob Zuma. Is it, looking at the decorum of uh, Chief Justice, is it something ethical to do, to go out in the public to talk sort of the merits of uh, the case? Okay. Well, again, I'll uh, uh, find the, the escape route. <laughs> <laughs> the matter is subjudic. Of saying that, that matter is is is, okay. is likely to be well. Mm -hmm. It's it's a topical matter to be fair yeah. to you, mm -hmm. and you would have seen last week there were many organizations, uh, a wide range mm -hmm. of organizations that condemned uh, those comments, mm. and I would say that again, taking it at the general level, it's true that it's actually illegal to do that because there's a, a judicial code of conduct mm -hmm. which prohibits judges from making political commentary. You might remember that uh, former Chief Justice Mukhweng Mukhweng was found mm -hmm. guilty mm -hmm. by the JSC for having commented on the Israeli yes. situation and yes. so on. Um, and so it's it's not debatable that it's, it's not... Uh, it's something that's completely unlawful for a judge to do, for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, because judges should not descend into the political arena. Yeah. So then the question becomes, in this particular instance, with these particular comments, was the line crossed or not? Yeah. That will be answered 
hopefully if the if there's a uh, if that issue comes before court or before the JSC. Yeah. I personally believe that the line was crossed, uh, but I might be subjective because it involves a case that I'm involved in of uh, his comments re- were regarding my own case of mm. uh, the former president. So I'd rather leave it to new, <laughs> to more neutral people yeah. to determine. Okay. But um, yeah. at a general level, there's no doubt that uh, for good reason, uh, uh, judges are prohibited Mm-hmm. from uh, making political comments. You, yeah. But w- of course, we know that they hold political views. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think anyone is naive to think mm-hmm. that they don't hold political views. Mm-hmm. After all, they do vote in the election. Yes, so they do. So it obviously means that they, they make political choices, but uh, they're not allowed to to make uh, those political views public, mm-hmm. especially while they're still in office. Yeah, yeah. and Justice Zondo, uh, he was chairing the uh, Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Allegations of State Capture, Mm. and now he becomes the uh, Chief Justice. Mm. Um, And this is outside the recommendations of uh, JSC. Mm. Would you say this uh, is a handshake or is being thanked for sort of exonerating the sitting president from serious, um, you know, uh, uh, charges of corruption? Well, that's what uh, former President Zuma alleges in his court papers mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in the challenge. He, his case is effectively that um, there was a, 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 some kind of deal, whether mm-hmm. it was written on paper or yeah. verbalized is another matter. Mm-hmm. But um, <coughs> he says that it, given the utterances made by uh, Justice Chief Justice Sondo, in, in his capacity as chair of the of the so-called Zonda Commission, mm-hmm. uh, which, I mean, he went as far as to say the country was saved by the election of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa in Nazareth in 2017. I mean, wh- what is that? <laughs> so he, 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 uh, uh, he being former President Zuma, mm-hmm. uh, complains that that shows that this was a, a, a deal. You rub my back, I'll rub your sure. back, as it were. Mm-hmm. So if you appoint me, then maybe I'll say nice things about you in my report here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, those are things that will be determined. Whether that is indeed the case will be determined by the court, but it does certainly look a, a bit strange for a, a judge to comment at that level. Obviously, he had to comment about state capture yes. and the role of the ANC mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. But uh, to take what is almost like a factional position. You, we, mm-hmm. we all know the factional situation in yes. South Africa. There's a group within the ANC that believes in the so-called nine wasted years. Yes. There's a group that believes that uh, there was nothing that was wrong. And there's a group of us as members of the public who yeah. believe that th- there's no good or bad faction, that they're yeah. all the same. Um, but... So it's clear that uh, Chief Justice on, uh, uh, let me say, chairperson on the, yeah. of the commission took a particular, <clears throat> view, chose one of those narratives as the correct one, which I don't think uh, was his place. Mm-hmm. Especially in the, his capacity as chairperson of the Zondo Commission. Mm-hmm. Remember, there he was not sitting as a judge per se, yes. in a judicial capacity. Mm-hmm. So we are free to criticize that uh, uh, that role because he he was basically working for the president. That's another issue, by yeah. the way. Remember that the commission gets appointed by the president. Yes, and and therefore I always make this example of when a judge is sitting in a, in a commission, mm-hmm. he's like a DG. He's just performing a function for the president, and he'll give a report to the president, mm-hmm. and the president will decide whether he implements or doesn't implement those recommendations. Yeah, unlike if it was a court order. Mm-hmm. Because a court order, the president would have no option. If yeah. a judge says you must do A, B, C, D by such and such a time, then yeah. it has to be done. And maybe sometimes we need to educate the public about those differences mm-hmm. because they just see a, a judge sitting there and they think, okay, well, he, yeah. whatever he says uh, is uh, is performing the function of a judge. He's not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the court is the final arbiter in any case. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's why the outcomes of a commission can be challenged mm-hmm. in court. Yes. You would remember there was something called the Siriti Commission. Yes. Its outcomes were challenged in court mm-hmm. and the court set it aside. Uh, so 
the it's a, it's just an administrative function like any other yeah. like somebody giving a dog license yeah. Yeah. it can be challenged in court and, and uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so you're talking about um the challenging of uh, reports and all uh, at, at the moment the recommendations of the state capture commission of inquiry are not fully um uh, implemented uh, some of the reasons include, of, of course, litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, other people are taking them on review. Mm -hmm. But why is there a long delay in terms of implementing the recommendations uh, of the uh, commission? And um, why are we not seeing, uh, you know, prominent people who are fingered in the, the, the report being prosecuted? Yeah, it goes back to whether the the relative toothlessness of a commission, as I say, where the commission can only make recommendations mm -hmm. to the president, to the NPA, to this one and that one, even to parliament. Mm -hmm. And those people may not like the recommendations. There are still recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which mm -hmm. has not been implemented yeah. 30 years or 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the problem with commissions of inquiry. Sometimes they are used politically just to quell people's anger. Okay. Um, so there'll be something, the Marikana massacre, yes. people are angry, then they say, oh, we'll appoint a commission, then there's a commission. Mm -hmm. After, by the time the commission finished, two or three years later, pe people have moved on to another topic here. Yeah. So it, it it's also a political tool. This thing of a commission, hence it's, yeah. it's appointed by a politician mm -hmm. who's the president. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that there is so there might be complete unwillingness yeah. on the part of the political heads who have to implement the co the the uh, recommendations. Yes. They must. They might just not want to implement them. That's the one problem. The second problem mm -hmm. might just be complete ineptitude and incompetence, for example, in the, on the part of the NPA, because mm -hmm. we've seen the NPA trying to do some prosecutions and they've had some uh, serious uh, failures in, in doing so. Yeah. Uh, one can think of the so-called uh, New Lane or New Lane case, mm -hmm. um, which bombed out. And now recently it was the Marcella Coco prosecution, yes. which has also bombed out. Yeah. So... Uh, is that a function of the fact that the findings themselves were weak, which might be, mm -hmm. or that the NPA is uh, inept in, in those prosecutions? It could be both. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Guptas made headlines in, in, in South Africa, and uh, they are also one of the people of interest in the State Capture uh, Commission of Inquiry, and uh, the Department of Justice has uh, sort of began the process of extradition. Mm. But to this day, they, 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 the Guptas have not been brought back. Why is, do you think we are being taken for a ride here? Is everything done meticulously, meticulously to ensure that uh, the Guptas face the music and are brought back in the country? No, I think uh, that was bungled up by... Uh, the Ministry of Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, if you look at it politically, I think we like headlines, mm -hmm. you know. So state capture equals the Guptas. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just a fallacy because, and I'm not saying the Guptas were innocent. I'm sure they did whatever they did. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can't equate state capture, which some you know, four or five people sitting in some place in sex and world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, trying to make deals. The real state capture is what is happening now uh, with the Ramaphosa regime, mm -hmm. where you have the entire state apparatus mm -hmm. uh, basically singing uh, to his tune. Um, you know, all the arms of the state mm -hmm. uh, seem to be uh, favor uh, favorable uh, to him. Uh, he can't be prosecuted. He can't be, you know, uh, found uh, mm -hmm. to uh, guilty even when there's hard evidence. You don't have to be a lawyer to know that you you cannot have uh, dollars stuffed in your couch. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, wherever you are, but all sorts of things, you know, and. The, the Reserve Bank, the Public Protector, the mm -hmm. Hawks, um, 
everyone is saying no uh, you know don't don't touch him that is that is what we should be worried about uh, the guptas you know you can identify them you can as you say uh, extradite them or arrest them or yeah. put them in jail but here yeah, we're dealing with in this current situation we're dealing with a system a whole system including the media you can't jail everyone you can't say okay i will take the public protector the okay. governor of the reserve bank the, yeah. the judges and the, the media and all that mm -hmm. that's for me is more frightening uh, where you have an an untouchable network as yeah. it were than a single individual who can be who can be um, identified mm -hmm. it's like you know if someone is guilty of murder you can go and find them mm -hmm. but when they're fighting covid-19 it's a whole yeah, different, a different thing, story yeah. Yeah. and i think that the current uh, um, brand of state capture is as pervasive as covid-19 it, yeah. it touches all of us uh, in many ways uh, than you can imagine mm. i mean take this thing about the rent manipulation yeah um it affects all of us you me it affects you know the price of bread the mm -hmm. price of milk mm -hmm. you know or, or the bond the interest rate so there's not a single south african who can say i'm untouched by this mm -hmm. it's it, it, that's grand corruption yeah. not some guy who tries to get a tender for coal or whatever yeah. that which you can you know you can uh, arrest as mm -hmm. uh, as it were so i think the guptas thing is a, a big exaggeration okay. um uh, and and ideologically loaded or factionally loaded uh, you know fake outrage about something which is was not a good thing but which is not our real problem our real yeah. problem is the fact that the white minority through this network mm -hmm. is still in charge of this yes. country apartheid is still in place in different forms and that's what we have to fight not mm -hmm. specific individuals. and i think that's why sometimes you are in hot water the media doesn't like you because when you represent uh, your clients you represent them in 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 a different yeah. way mm -hmm. like now you're talking about the focus not actually being the guptas mm -hmm. someone would argue that you are captured mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is not true mm -hmm. the truth is that uh, 1 billion Uh, has been wasted or has been spent on the mm. state capture commission of inquiry and uh, it's not about the guptas alone mm. let's look at the system mm. at its entirety mm. uh, who is behind the system mm. it's white uh, mono, uh, white monopoly mm. capital mm. so in the best interest of south africans with regards to the state capture what do you think should be the way forward now Well, the only way forward is to change the government. I mean, the Economic Freedom Fighters is here to, as a revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. By revolution, we mean an overhaul of the system, mm -hmm. a complete overhaul. All these enclaves of power that I was talking about, whether mm -hmm. they reside in the media, in uh, white business, in the judiciary, in the uh, uh, state institutions such as the Reserve Bank, have mm -hmm. to be dismantled uh, and replaced with uh, you know uh, institutions w which are directed into the interests of the of the people uh, because that's that's what real capture is um, in fact the idea of state capture or seizure of mm -hmm. the state mm -hmm. is a is a, a, a leninist concept mm -hmm. because co uh, according to lenin mm -hmm. the state is an instrument of power and a monopoly uh, to and has a monopoly of violence mm -hmm. of 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 uh, you know state violence yes and um, therefore it is in the interest of the majority to seize or, or capture the state in the mm -hmm. interest of the of the people mm -hmm. to be an instrument for their own uh, liberation and advancement mm -hmm. and that's what we try to do so a revolutionary movement the only difference with us is that we mm -hmm. at this stage would like to seize the power through the ballot mm -hmm. rather than through the bullet oh, as yes. it were but it's exactly the same the our objective is the same as anybody else who, who might want to take the state mm -hmm. that's why we use the term by any means necessary yes and um the means that are conducive 
for for now yeah. are, are political. It's the most difficult thing because you have to go uh, to registration yes. drives and all yeah. that. HP and some people vote. say, no, but yeah. why are you doing that? You should just t- take up arms and, yeah. and throw grenades. Yeah. You can't do that when there is a political space. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that political space is ever closed, well, that's a, a different matter. Mm-hmm. Because that's what happened, for example, in 1961 uh, when, when the uh, organizations were banned. Mm-hmm. The political space was closed, yes. and therefore people then had to, to resort to other means. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as the objectives are concerned, our objectives must always remain focused on uh, seizing power and capturing the state apparatus for the benefit of our people, of the poorest of mm-hmm. the poor, not a small elite that wants to preserve its uh apartheid power mm-hmm. with a, f- a few black collaborators such yes. as the Ramaphosas of this world yeah. who just want to reform apartheid. You can't reform apartheid. Apartheid is a grotesque, cruel, mm. violent, racist system. So you can't brush it and say, okay, I'm just going to brush it on the ears and so on. Mm-hmm. You need to destroy it and kill it yeah. and then in its place replace it with a, with a new system. That's what is the task of every single revolutionary in, in this country yeah. is to dismantle the state directly, not beat about the bush about it. Yeah. yeah. And through economic freedom. That's it. And yeah. install a situation of economic freedom because that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Remember, all these people, whether it's the, uh, the, the, the uh, judges or, mm-hmm. or, or, the, or, the, or the media or whatever, all what we call the state yeah. apparatus, Ultimately, the objective, whether wittingly or unwittingly, is mm-hmm. to preserve the status quo. Yes. What is the status quo? The status quo is a situation where black people are subjugated into a position of nothingness, of indignity, of, 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 of perpetual childhood, so to speak. Mm-hmm. White people are the superior masters of, of, of what happens. That's the status quo. So anything that mm-hmm. seeks to preserve that status quo must be destroyed by any means necessary, yeah. with ruthlessly so. And um, so that's that's really what we're up against. We're up against a an entire network, complicated, sophisticated network with a lot of resources, mm-hmm. a lot of voice and propaganda and mm-hmm. all sorts of things. So... You were saying like the media doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, anyone who can get affected by that kind of nonsense is not a true revolutionary. Sure. If you get affected by the noise of your detractors mm-hmm. and uh, caricatures and so on. In mm-hmm. fact, when they do that, you should actually be more encouraged because sure. it means you are doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. The day you get praised by them, then you must know you're selling out. Yeah. Because uh, why would someone who, that you want to destroy, you want to destroy their system and comfort. Mm-hmm. If they praise you, it means you are doing something wrong. You are assisting them. Yeah. So um, I, I, I would uh, be very worried the day they start uh, thinking yeah. that... Uh, when you I'm become very, the darling yeah, of the no. media. <laughs> then then I'll, it will be time to retire. Yeah. yeah. And uh, advocate, you talked about um, uh, currency manipulation. The EFF uh, was the first in parliament in 2018 to table a motion questioning uh, whether the National Treasury or South African Reserve Bank is aware of currency uh, manipulation and whether there are steps they're taking to root out this kind of uh, corruption. The media was silent. They didn't uh, shine a spotlight on what the EFF did. And a few years later, boom, now we are the the, the standard uh, chartered uh, bank has confirmed that in fact we were involved in this uh, uh, rand uh, manipulation of the currency and uh, why do you think the media in south africa or oh, government doesn't listen to the eff when it sort of um, raises something very fundamental well, you know, it's not a coincidence that uh, you hear the um, DA, for example, mm-hmm. uh, as a, a representative, which has chosen to be a representative of white people in, mm-hmm. in, in South Africa in mm-hmm. order to preserve the, the, the economic status mm-hmm. of those people, that it has declared the EFF as 
enemy number one. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, people wonder. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Why would um, an opposition party, which is supposed to be fighting the ruling party, declare mm-hmm. another opposition party enemy yeah. number one? Mm-hmm. It's, I'm sure it's unheard of uh, in anywhere in the world. Yeah. But that's because we are here facing a unique situation. The DA is not uh, fooled. They know exactly who is fighting for fundamental change mm-hmm. and who is threatening their their status. Mm-hmm. So this government is made up of currently, especially now, it's made up of actual sellouts in BNP directly, mm-hmm. you know, who are collaborators with the system but are clothed as um, pseudo-revolutionaries. Uh, mm-hmm. You heard what uh, Mr. Likota said in Parliament, uh, mm-hmm. for example, about the current uh, president and how he sold out mm-hmm. during yes, stu- yes, student yes. days. Yeah. yeah. So this is a government headed and uh, managed by uh, people who are anti-black mm. because they are anti-black in the sense that they their job is to be what we call the security guards of white monopoly capital. Oh. Uh, and that's what they do, literally security guards to make okay. sure, you know, when I want to go to pick and pay, if I want to take yeah. To safeguard bread, the interests of wines. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's, what the, that's what they do. And that's why they cannot be enemy uh, number one. That's why white monopoly capital can spend a billion rand to make sure that uh, Ramaphosa is the president of the ANC. Why mm-hmm. would they, who does that? Mm-hmm. They only do it because they are hiring just like I would hire a security company. They're yeah. hiring a security guard to ensure that their interests are, are protected. Mm-hmm. And that's how we must see the ANC. It's not the first time. Remember, for the past 400 years, the pattern is the same. It just The actors just change. When white people, Jan van Riebeek, arrived there, mm-hmm. I, I, I was not there, but I can yeah, tell 1652. you... 1652. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you that the first thing they did when they realized that they want to stay here and mm-hmm. not just pass through to India mm-hmm. was to find people who were going to assist them to to you know to to take the cattle of the inhabitants to fight the wars to infiltrate to get in into the the, the rest of the of the country mm-hmm. and history tells us that there were even then, traditional leaders who fought on the side of the whites, yeah. others uh, uh, fought for, for the people to preserve the land. Mm-hmm. So that happened through colonialism. Fast forward to the apartheid time. Apartheid could never have lasted for even one year mm-hmm. if it wasn't for black collaborators, homeland leaders, black policemen, mm-hmm. and so on. So an oppressive regime must always have uh, security guards oh. who are represented by the people who look like you and me yes. uh, so that they be- become a buffer. And that is what the ANC has become. Mm. And it's very painful. Yes. And so we must, when we destroy the institution, we must destroy the master and the security guard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So now we, we know that uh, the EFF um, in parliament um uh, CIC Julius Malima, Deputy President Floyd Shibambu, uh, Commissar Mbuisen, um, Commissar Vuyan, Commissar Sinao Tambo, as well as uh, the SG, mm-hmm. uh, Marshal Tamini, they could be, they could be uh, suspended mm-hmm. from attending next year's uh, State of the Nation Address. Mm-hmm. And this uh, is at the back of after, this came after, uh, obviously, the EFF staged a protest mm. uh, calling on Ramon Kosa to, to, to step down. Mm. Why is this happening now? Why, what is parliament fearing? Why are they trying to eliminate uh, the EFF in parliament? What's your take on that? Yeah, look, it goes back. We have to understand these things in their political perspective. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what I'm saying. The state... This thing called the state, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, this is something that President Zuma uh, used to say, and some of us didn't listen. Mm-hmm. That the, if you're going to capture the state, you you must capture the executive, the judiciary, and the oh, legislature. Yes. Yeah. So the all these become instruments of the state, mm-hmm. um, and including the so-called fourth estate, which is the the, the media. Yes. Also, it's the three arms of government plus the media. media, Yeah, that's why it's called the fourth estate. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's uh, so 
anyone who manages, as has happened now, to capture mm-hmm. those or the majority of those has mm-hmm. as, as, as done the job. So mm-hmm. the parliament, the current parliament, which is what, how they behaved, for example, if you looked at the impeachment mm-hmm. processes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, what kind of parliament impeaches the, the best performing um, public protector in oh, the history yes. of South Africa? Yeah. What kind of parliament now is preparing to impeach the best judge president, Judge Justice Lope, that we ever had, mm-hmm. who was thrown into uh, a hostile terrain in the Western Cape and managed to transform that uh, mm-hmm. uh, place radically. And these people are now being punished by people who are supposed to be uh, representatives of the public. Mm-hmm. So that's how you must see the current persecution of uh, the the uh, leadership of the, the EFF. EFF. Yeah. I was in parliament when this happened. I mean, all that happened, there was a protest. Yes. The president of the EFF walked into the stage carrying a placard. Mm-hmm. If you are threatening someone, I mean, how was yeah. he going to attack anyone? Because both his hands were, car- yeah. were carrying a placard. Mm-hmm. So all these people, they know this. They know that, I mean, uh, there's no way that any of them actually think that uh, Julius Malema was going to that stage. He was going to go and punch Cyril Ramaphosa. That's ridiculous. Everybody who has a brain knows that that's <laughs> yeah. not, a, that's not it's unthinkable. Case, yeah. yeah. So it's persecution. Mm-hmm. And I'm so proud of the leadership of the EFF for taking the stance that they did. They walked out of that nonsense kangaroo court and they can do whatever they want. What, what can they do? They mm-hmm. can ban the leadership of the EFF for 30 days from parliament. Mm-hmm. So what? That in itself is a revolutionary act. Mm-hmm. If they, Because people will start wondering, yeah. where are these people that we voted? Yes. Uh, they are not there for 30 days. And then they'll remember they are not there because they were protesting against the shenanigans of this government. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's say, for example, they, they could ban all the EFF uh, MPs, all 44 of them. Mm-hmm. What will happen in the next SONA? It, it will be for the first time that at the SONA the, the, there is no action. Nobody mm-hmm. is raising the concerns of the people. Mm-hmm. That alone is a form of protest. It will be the, the most absence. boring proceedings It will be the ever. most boring <laughs> SONA. Everyone will yeah. be complaining. And mm-hmm. therefore, mm-hmm. you can't win. You see, if you are a sellout, you think that you can win some short-term gains. But the people are not stupid. So if you uh, remove the, the EFF or beat them up, mm-hmm. you are actually mobilizing people to say, why are these ones being beaten up? Why is the DA, when it does exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. allowed to walk out nicely from the house? But these ones, the at the slightest provocation, you must call the white shirts and beat them up and actually injure. You know, one of yeah. our commissars, Rene oh, yes. is still has injuries. Uh, mm-hmm. Our former SG, uh, Gotrich Gadi, still has back injuries because they were assaulted by the state. And these are public for refusing to, to be uh, security guards, by the way. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. For challenging them uh, as, as uh, you know, as, as protectors mm-hmm. of, um, of 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 white privilege. Mm-hmm. Remember the first thing we did when we got to parliament in 2014. Yeah, the, we had six percent. The ANC had 62 mm-hmm. percent, which meant we had, which meant that together we had the two thirds majority yes. needed to bring back our land, for example. Yes. And we offered mm-hmm. that 6% to them. And they said no. Uh, why? Not because they don't know that we need land. Yes. Not because they don't know that the economic fortunes of our people uh, reside in the land, but because their job was to protect the white privilege of mm-hmm. the land that had been dispossessed from black people over a period of almost 400 years mm-hmm. and to stand there and say, no, no, you can't touch uh, the, this land. Yeah. Let the bus uh, continue to to own it. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, that's the relationship. You see, for us, parliament, <laughs> they think the reason that you, you can't hurt someone who cannot be hurt by that, sure. by that thing. Mm-hmm. We have no time for this parliament. If they said we must get out of parliament, we'll get out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. For us, parliament is a is just one of the means that we use to mobilize our people for revolution. Mm-hmm. There are three terrains of our revolution that we have identified as the EFF. Mm-hmm. It's parliament, it's the courts, and it's the streets. 
the court and the parliament, we can dispose tomorrow. We can say we're never, never going to go back to court. Yeah. Or we're not going to parliament. Mm -hmm. One thing we'll never discard is the mobilization of our people on the, on the, on the ground. Yeah. So parliament, you, as I say, you can't you can't hurt us by taking out or taking us out of parliament because we're mm -hmm. not there to like them, you know, to to eat chicken uh, during lunch. We're there. That's why we wear overalls in parliament. Mm -hmm. We're there to work mm -hmm. and to make sure that our people are liberated. Yeah. It's it's not a holiday. Uh, as it is for them. So they think if they take you out of parliament, ah, now you're going to... But actually, it would be great yeah. if they take our people out of parliament because we'll have 44 mm -hmm. more soldiers to go into the yeah. ground to mobilize for the next election. Yeah. yeah. And uh, on that uh, story of um, currency manipulation, mm -hmm. the EFF has always been in the forefront calling for a state bank. Do you think that will be the solution that will end uh, manipulation by private sector? Yes, in the main banks. Of course. Mm -hmm. Remember when we we, we talk about um, the, the the Freedom Charter said that the banks and monopoly industries will mm -hmm. be in the hands of the people uh, as yes. a whole. That's exactly the point. The banking system is mm -hmm. the nerve center of any uh, economy, mm -hmm. and um, for example, the discussion about the nationalization of the Reserve Bank is not a cosmetic thing. Imagine if you had a, a reserve bank that was totally in the hands of the people of South Africa, mm -hmm. then you'd be sure that the regulation of the banks is going to be rigorous because mm -hmm. it is going to be in our interest. Mm -hmm. And therefore the rent manipulation would not have happened or it would have been picked up early or it would have been prohibited and, and, and you know, uh, dealt with. Mm -hmm. But the, they don't see that connection. When you talk about a state bank, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. A state bank could never manipulate the rent oh, yes. against the interests of you and me mm -hmm. who have to buy bread and milk and so on. And it would therefore serve as a, a, a bulwark uh, yeah. against the private banks to the extent that you allow private banks to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are things that they think we're just churning out slogans mm -hmm. when we talk about nationalization, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's because you want to have public control of these assets because the private sector if the private sector owns escom mm -hmm. or any any entity mm -hmm. it's the job of the private sector is to make profit yes and you can't blame me i always used to say that when i was at the sabc i said if i was the ceo of a privately owned broadcaster mm -hmm. then i wouldn't broadcast in some uh, God for second place where there are people who don't have uh, money to even pay for the yes. advertising uh, uh, for, for the merchandise that is being advertised. Mm -hmm. But you do that because the state has a mandate. That's why you can't find um, Mail and Guardian yeah. in, in my village there. Uh, because why would they do it? It would be stupid of them to distribute it there because maybe they'll sell two copies. Mm -hmm. uh, and just that the amount of money to take it there mm -hmm. will, will not make uh, uh, business sense. Yeah. So that's why you, I can only find it in the city. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't, public goods cannot be distributed like that. Mm -hmm. Public goods, the logic is exactly different. Yes. You actually have to go out to those far-flung areas mm -hmm. and provide uh, services. Yes. Uh, now, if you are driven by profit, you, you, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so these banks, when they manipulate the rent, they are not doing something that's out of character. Their job is to make sure that by hook or crook, they maximize the profit for, yes. their, for their shareholders. So if they do that by cutting corners, they might have started in a small way and then they realize, oh, this government yeah. is fast asleep. Let's do more. And, and then now we're talking trillions of rent. Yeah. And that makes all what you call state capture of the yeah. Guptas look like a Sunday picnic because <laughs> the, this is the real uh, yeah. state capture that is. Because a trillion place. made a day, mm. and that, like in one day, it's, it's just massive. Yeah. I was involved in that case, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, when it started, I was involved. I was acting for the Competition Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these banks were taking technical points. We had to, we, we spent like two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, debating uh, whether this, the, you know, the, this is drafted in a particular way and mm -hmm. so on. Eventually, because we knew that uh, 
they were taking those points to try and delay the yeah. inevitable. Fortunately, some of them have started to talk and and actually reveal the truth, and they've given statements to the Competition Commission, confessions, yeah. so to speak, to say, yeah. yes, we were involved in this. So, But the others are still denying. Yeah. So indeed, uh, we just need a, a state bank as a watchdog to ensure that in fact, there isn't any manipulation that exists uh, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And you talked about uh, being at the SABC. Um, that was between 2005 and 2009. Yes. Uh, how has it been for you uh, at the helm of the SABC public broadcaster? Uh, what were the dynamics at the time? What were some of the challenges or some of the things that you've implemented uh, to sort of improve the affairs or the you know outlook of the SABC. Yeah, no, that was um, the one of the best things that I've ever done. You mm -hmm. know, I was at that time I was kind of taking a break from law, okay. and I was working at, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was approached by uh, at that stage to put my hand up for the SABC, I did not hesitate. Okay. Because because I saw it as a as national duty. I mean, I had to give up on very nice uh, uh, shares and all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but um, you were called to serve. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, that's um, it. Was you see the I always joke because people say you know when there's an EFF government I'll be the minister of justice. I say no, no, no. Yeah. Mine will be arts and culture and broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I have a, a big passion. Okay. I believe that. One of the ways to deal with our people's mindset mm -hmm. and to undo the propaganda and the state machinery, as it were, is to educate our people okay. uh, and ab about where, who are we, where do we come from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, promoting our languages. Oh, you yes. know, I, I cringe every time I see someone who has children who cannot speak any African language, yeah. cannot speak their own mother tongue. Who you know who, who, who are proud because they speak a foreign language such mm. as uh, English. Yeah. Um, so that's what the SABC can do if it's if it's uh, properly positioned. Okay. And we developed the, a strategy called Broadcasting for Citizen Empowerment, mm -hmm. which I believe is still in place now. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a ground up kind of strategy where we consulted all sorts of stakeholders. So it's been difficult 10 years even after I've left there okay. to dismantle that strategy. Yeah. Because it was a strategy that was not just for South Africa, it was for the entire world, a model mm -hmm. for public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. What is public broadcasting? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how do you actually um, uh, make sure that it, 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 it creates, what we called it then the Green Revolution, mm -hmm. a, an entire revolution of consciousness in society. So I had a great team as well. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it ended in, in 2009, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no, I'm very proud. And one of the things that makes me proud, whenever I go to the CBC now, the, the workers, they, they always say, yeah. when are you coming back? We, we miss <laughs> yeah. those days. And they will yeah. give it a nice and yeah. awesome package there. <laughs> yes, of course. No, but yeah. that, that was their fault because they yeah. abused me. Um, 14 million. Yeah, they abused me very, very badly. <laughs> no, it was yeah. not a gift, by the way. It was yeah. a, a sure. money that one would have earned mm -hmm. if they had not abused me mm -hmm. until the end of my, of, of my contract. Mm -hmm. But it came with a lot of, of suffering. I mean, I was suspended for about 18 months, mm -hmm. you know, uh, taken from pillar to post. I had to take them to court. I had to fight back. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I won that fight. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, what is your understanding of the current SABC? Do you think it's sticking to its uh, core mandate? I mean, as a public broadcaster, from time to time, uh, there will be bailouts uh, for, uh, at the SABC uh, due to cash, low, uh, cash flow problems. What do you think are some of the you know, factors towards the SABC's uh, constant cash flow problems? Now, the problem with the SABC is the funding model. The funding model is just skewed uh, because m most of the, the, the vast majority of the funding of the SABC comes from advertising, uh, you know, and then you have a, a minuscule, I think, 
two or three percent that comes from the government, mm -hmm. and about five percent or so comes from TV licenses. Mm -hmm. That's a ridiculous model because it goes back to what I was saying. You cannot have a state-owned enterprise that actually runs like a business because okay. if if you do that, then you are incentivizing them towards the profit profit motive. I, I used to say this at the SABC. If the mod funding model is like this, say you give me two programs. Say this program is going to bring a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. The content is rubbish, but it's going to bring a lot of money. Okay. This other program is going to educate the people. It will make a difference, but it will make you to lose money or it's not going to make... Which one do you think I'm going to play? I'll play this one. Mm -hmm. Why? Because... I'm judged according to what profit I'm making. Uh, as, a, as the CEO, if I'm judged like that, then I'm obviously going to go for the for the one mm -hmm. that is um, more likely to say, oh, now we made a profit and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, there's nothing wrong, by the way, making a profit in this in, in an, an SOE because that money can be plowed back into, into the, into, into, into the, um, um, you know the development yes. of the, of the institution, yeah. but it should not be the driving force. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that as some. I mean, the last time the 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 SABC made a, a profit three years or four years in a row was when I was there. Mm -hmm. That was the last time. Uh, so it, I'm not saying that because it, it it was not the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but I'm saying it should not be the the driving force. So that's the problem. The problems are the fundamental level mm -hmm. the government should just um be bold and fund the SABC and uh, increase the 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 public mandate yeah, yeah. and uh, there has been um uh, claims that uh, there is political pressure in the running of uh, the SABC day to day affairs uh, is there any truth in that? Uh, did that happen uh, when you were still the CEO at the SABC? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the reasons that they got rid of me because I, I told them from day one, yeah. nobody's ever going to do that to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because maybe of my own political credentials, even at the time, I, I mean, there's no Mickey Mouse politician who was going to phone me to tell me you must do this or do that. I'd tell them to go to hell, as it were, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think they, they didn't like that. Um, there were instances where I even uh, defied uh, what I was told, I don't know how far through, where uh, messages from the president to say mm -hmm. this must be done or not, and said, no, I'm not going to do that mm -hmm. if it's not uh, within the, the, the policies of the, of the, of the SABC. Yes, of course, the, the SABC is such a powerful force that... Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to influence it. So the pressure doesn't just come from government. It also comes from business, from sports people. Everyone would, would want to control the SABC. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need a leadership that is impervious to that, that's able to uh, to deal with stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, fairly, as mm -hmm. it were, but not be susceptible to be pressurized by them or bribed by yeah. them or, you know, manipulated in, you know, I was always saying, you know, the the for for us, the focus was so much on delivery yes. that I don't even think I don't know maybe there were some corrupt people there, mm -hmm. but uh, I I can't if if I, I think in the entire four years I, I don't even not even a single person came to me. We had tenders there, some of them running into billions. Yeah, mm -hmm. no one even ever came to me to say, look, uh, can we do a deal and so on? Because yeah. they, they probably knew I would probably have phoned the police. And say what are, what are you talking about? Yeah. So you need that kind of leadership that is focused on the job that that cannot be bought, um, that cannot be manipulated politically mm -hmm. or even manipulated by by uh, business or, yeah. or anyone else, but uh, do things in the interest of the people. Yeah. And, and what, I did have such a leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your, the tension be about between you and? Uh, 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 is it uh, 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 Snooki. Snooki. Yeah, Snooki no, Snooki Zikalala. There was no tension between me and Snooki Zikalala. Again, it was the, he just, uh, I got information that he had uh, taken confidential information to 
the ANC headquarters mm-hmm. from a very reliable source that I will name one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but a very highly placed okay. person in the in the in the ANC. Um, and and therefore, when I got that information, I called him, and uh, uh, he did not deny it uh, at that time. So then I suspended him because uh, it had to be investigated. Mm-hmm. But um, I suppose because there were, at that time, uh, people in the board who regarded him as untouchable. They thought, yeah. they thought this was, a, 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 you know, like an act of treason. Yeah. So it was a funny situation where I, I suspended him in the afternoon and in the mo- by the morning <laughs> I had been suspended <laughs> myself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so those are some of the dynamics there. And people mm-hmm. didn't realize that actually what I was doing was mm-hmm. to save the SABC. Yeah. Because nobody, well, even if it was me, mm-hmm. any, if, if it, an allegation like that had come up, yeah. I would have had to be suspended. If it was a lie, I would defend myself and that yeah. would be the end of it. That's how you run institutions. And I'm a big believer. So I didn't care, quite frankly, that they treated me like that because given uh, the same situation, I would do the same thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm a big believer in institutions. Yeah. Uh, you know, people think that a democracy is not built by individuals mm-hmm. or, you know, at all. A democracy is built by institutions. So we have to build institutions and protect yeah. them with everything we have. Mm-hmm. So, for example, that's why I'm proud of the EFF. Yeah. This is an institution that we built from ground up, from nothing. Mm-hmm. And it, it has been built now to be currently the third largest political party mm-hmm. in South Africa. That's an institution. It's not about Julius Malema or yeah. Floyd Chibambu or Dalimpofo or... or um, uh, Veronica Mente yeah. or Umpila Mautwe or, or, or any of our leaders. Yeah. It's it's about an institution that must be an instrument in the hands of our people to liberate themselves. Yes. Long before all of us are no longer there, there'll be a time when none of us are not even uh, featured mm-hmm. um, in, 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 in leadership or any of the structures. But we would have left an institution intact mm-hmm. here at Winnie Mandela House. Uh, th- this also is an institution. Yeah. You know, th- th- so that that's, um, I'm, I'm very passionate about that. So people would destroy uh, the NPA, the Public Protector's Office, w- which is currently happening, for example, around the, the Palapala issue, yeah. the Reserve Bank, uh, the Hawks, you know, the judiciary. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, those are the people who are enemies of uh, of the of the public, yeah, because you you cannot do that. Yeah, and you have highlighted that uh, during your t- uh, tenure at the SABC, there was no political uh, pressure or influence. You no, remember no, not directly. Not there directly. was always pressure yeah, because sure. people will always hint that you should do this and that. Yeah. But you might, I always said the a good CEO of the SABC is not someone who mm-hmm. has absence of pressure, but someone who knows how to deal with okay. it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the former group CEO of uh, SABC, Saudi, uh, he implemented a policy that the SABC should not cover violent uh, pro- uh, service delivery protest. Mm. Would you say that was some of the examples of uh, political pressure? Because obviously, if you cover up mm. or don't cover a, a, a political or rather a service delivery protest, it means no one would know that there is bad governance mm. in maybe in KZN or Northwest or anywhere in No, that the was the, r- the wrong policy. You can't mm-hmm. do that. You can't um, sugarcoat society. Mm-hmm. Because if you're doing that, you're a propagandist. You should portray society. Mm-hmm. If you're a public broadcaster, yours is not just to chase the, the mm-hmm. headline or, a, or the blood, you know, to see blood yes. flowing, yeah. You must cover the pub, the, the protest, obviously. Yes. But then you might want to take a step further by going to the community, finding out what what, what are the, yes. the real issues and making mm-hmm. sure that the government is, is aware of those. Mm-hmm. But to say that you must hide it is, is completely wrong. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also worked at the National Anti-Corruption Forum. Mm-hmm. Uh, this also, I, I would like to believe, was so in line with your profession. Talk us through that. Yes, well, very few people know that uh, in 1999, I think April, towards the end of the Mandela um, parliament, mm-hmm. first parliament, 
the, there was a summit in Parliament called the National Anti-Corruption Summit, okay. uh, which was convened by Parliament itself, uh, which has a multi-stakeholder uh, body. If I mean, if we knew now what we know, if we knew then what we know now, yeah. we would have put even more effort. Yeah. But uh, this was a, a visionary um, approach, as it were, mm -hmm. which called all sectors. I was then representing the legal sector, I think, okay. there earlier. Mm -hmm. This was a two-day summit which said, what can we do about corruption to mm -hmm. prevent it going forward? Mm -hmm. Anyway, to cut a long story short, yeah. that summit in the end had to elect a, a leadership. Okay. And it was decided that there should be 30, a 30-member 30 leadership, 10 from business, 10 from government, and 10 from civil society. Mm -hmm. And then I was elected as the chair of that, okay. uh, of that uh, uh, body. Yeah. It was an interesting body because we had 10 ministers, I remember, Steve Trett, uh, I think Trevor Manuel, Charantin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fraser Mulekete, and, yeah. and others. 10 ministers, 10 of us from civil society and 10 business leaders mm -hmm. to tackle this uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And um, you can imagine what the, the kinds of, of, of meetings we were, we, were, yeah. we were having. But that I did that because... I've always had a passion. I, I think corruption is probably the worst thing you can do to a people. Mm -hmm. To steal even one cent of uh, the people's, um, uh, uh, you know, hard-earned taxpayers' yeah. money mm -hmm. is, is something that's unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And we did put together structures and systems. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it fizzled away, and mm -hmm. I think there's a, some current effort to revive it. There's a new incarnation of yeah. that, yeah. But um, it's, uh, yeah, corruption is something that I've always been uh, completely and totally prepared to fight against. Yeah, and I think uh, with your passion in fighting corruption and in the uh, uh, fight for a fairer legal system, I think mm -hmm. we have a good person in you and uh, we're, South Africa will be a, a better uh, country with you present. And let's look at um, your political uh, activism. You worked with uh, very closely with uh, Mama Winnie Madigizela yes. Mandela uh, while she was uh, the head of the ANC Social Welfare mm. uh, Department. What are some of the reflections do you have to this end? Mm. Well, even long before that, remember mm. in the 80s, she was basically the foremost, uh, probably the most senior ANC leader in mm -hmm. the country, yes. known, known ANC leader in the country. And so uh, those of us who were activists, uh, both uh, above ground and, and, the, and in the underground, mm -hmm. were, would interact. Mm -hmm. uh, because some of, remember, some of our comrades would use the what we called the, the Lesotho route, for example, yes. to leave the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, her, her house in Brantford was effectively one of the stopovers uh, and very other safe houses in, the, in that area. Um, so even when I was a student leader, we had those interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and until she decided, uh, which was a shock to us at the time, yeah. that she was un, uh, kind of unbending herself and coming back to Soweto, yeah. which she did. And then, so we continued uh, to work with her uh, in various projects, as I say, mm -hmm. above the, and, and also mm -hmm. some in, in, in some of the more dangerous uh, world mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the underground. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I mean, th that was one person that who symbolized the defiant spirit mm -hmm. uh, of w which is really needed. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a missed opportunity. I mean, firstly, I think that, again, I'm proud of our leadership, uh, current leadership, for naming this place Winnie Mandela oh, yeah. House. Yeah. Yes. Because um, I think it symbolizes exactly that we, we are in what you called a, a revolutionary house. Yes. I don't think um, <laughs> this country has produced uh, very few mm -hmm. revolutionaries of, of, the, of that caliber. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot about uh, hardship, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, you know the ability to be vilified by all sorts and insundered and insulted and be called all sorts of things, but still be focused in, in what you have to do. And um, you saw when she passed away that the whole country was affected. Yeah. So all that hard work that was put by the enemy to try and, and make her to be mm -hmm. like a, you know, a nothing yeah. uh, came to waste because the people are not stupid, by the way. 
people know their leaders. They know mm-hmm. who cares about them. You don't have to put an advert or a, yes. Know, they, they 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 know who they who their real leaders are. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we learned quite a lot. So by the time of the unbanning and uh, the social welfare department, uh, that was the easy part because yeah. by, it was after the unbanning. The mm-hmm. difficulties were 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 before then. So uh, that's one of the the things I have in common with the president and CIC of the of the. Uh, yeah. EFF. Yeah. I think I always say when the reason why we have that that rapport is because we, of these commonalities. We're both uh, sons of domestic workers. We started in oh, Corsas, yeah. went to the youth league, uh, and were mentored by uh, such giants as uh, with Matic Zelo Mandela. Yeah. Um, and that's why when he gave that passionate speech at the funeral, oh, yes. it was actually from the heart because mm-hmm. he, he was practically like the son mm-hmm. uh, and and um, having been groomed uh, uh, by her. Yeah. yeah, it was a loss. And the biggest loss for the ANC was when they refused to make her the deputy president in their 1997 conference. So they uh, had that opportunity. Oh yes, no. The, the the two major turning points for mm-hmm. the ANC were in 1991. We were in the group that had wanted to put Chris Hani as the deputy president, oh, and that yes. was uh, sabotaged somehow. Okay. And then in 1997, there was uh, the effort to to bring uh, Comrade Winnie as the deputy president, mm-hmm. and I I believe that on both of those missed opportunities, we could have had a different South Africa today. Yeah. Um, if um, if, if, if that had happened. But um, it is what it is. And then, of course, the, the biggest disaster was uh, the, in Mangawong when then they, they put this current one yeah. to, <laughs> to, to the way to be the president. This one. Yeah. Shame, <laughs> problems yeah. of the problems. Oh, shame, yeah. I mean, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's look at... Um, your relationship with um, uh, Chris Hani. Mm-hmm. There's a picture, I think, on your WhatsApp as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were behind the mic with Chris Hani. Uh, what was happening there and uh, what was your political involvement at the time? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, another child of our struggle. Comrade Chris, uh, I got to know him after the unbending. We, we both worked. Uh, I was on the um, 18th floor of, of the, the then Lutuli House, which okay. was known as Shell House. He worked on the 19th floor at MH2. Mm-hmm. So we got to know each other very closely, and um, both I- in that capacity, but also just mm-hmm. as uh, as activists. He's somebody that I just respect for, because his politics, I was always associated with what one might call the radical wing of the, oh. of the ANC. Peter Mukaba, your, uh, Winnie Mandela, yeah. your Chris Hani, um, uh, to some extent, although I didn't have much interactions with him, uh, Harry Kuala, okay. those were the people who were seen as the as the fire eaters. Yeah, Tony Yengeni mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Pado Misa at the time. So I got to know him in that in the in the. As I say, we were, even went to um, Durban to campaign for him to be the deputy president. Yeah, uh, to be Nelson Mandela's deputy president. Mm-hmm. So in that picture that you see there, we were doing the toy toy, okay. uh, you know, uh, in uh, uh, or the slogan as we called it. Uh, it was an uh, SACP rally. Okay. Um, I think I'm not sure if it was at FNB or at Orlando Stadium, mm-hmm. but it was a big uh, SACP rally, and um, we we yeah, uh, I was one of the MCs okay. and. Um, uh, and, and we, well, yeah. when it was his turn to speak, I think, yeah. Comrade Peter, you can also, in that picture, you can also see Peter Mukaba. Yes. So it's myself, it's Peter Mukaba, oh. and uh, okay. Chris Hane. So you drew inspiration from these uh, oh, yes. icons. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, in the struggle, I think we, it's a, we have to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, even an organization, mm-hmm. it has to learn from its mistakes. Okay. And that's actually how we built the, the first EFF leadership. We were, it was trial and error, you know, yeah. and we, we learned, we made mistakes, we learned from them. Mm-hmm. And uh, now 10 years later, it's the greatest thing to watch this organization being what it is and knowing now that it will fly on its own. 
uh, you know, at that time we could have, uh, there were times when yeah. we, some of us had to uh, even mortgage our houses to make sure that the, 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 um, organization stands mm -hmm. now it, it it doesn't need us in the, in the, in the, in that in that mm -hmm. fashion and that's that's really what is uh, satisfying yeah and and um, so if you don't learn from other other people uh, even learning from when they do the wrong thing as it were uh, to say look I must not do this and, and not do that then mm -hmm. you'll never be a, a complete revolutionary yeah. because a revolutionary must learn until you die you because you can't say now I'm fine. I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. How can you be perfect when the people are still oppressed? Mm -hmm. You must see the the continued uh, oppression of the people as your own failure, mm -hmm. as a personal failure, and therefore that's what must drive you to mm -hmm. continually improve yourself. Yeah, yeah. and you had uh, Afro hair. <laughs> Almost every revolutionary at the time had Afro. It wasn't an in thing. <laughs> what was happening there? No, it was an in thing. In fact, even to have Afro hair was like a compromise. <laughs> the, the in thing was to have unkempt hair that oh. was all over. Because it was part of the, if you like, what, what our kids now call the swag. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The swag of the time <laughs> was, um, okay. was, was, you know, to not to care so much mm -hmm. about your looks and uh, your grooming and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, to to look like a revolutionary, yeah, to, to you only concern to. yourself day yeah. and night with the liberation of your people. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were prepared, as I say, to sit in, in jail. Mm -hmm. It's not a nice thing to sit in yeah. jail, even for one day, mm -hmm. but uh, to sit there for months and months and go back and, and be tortured and, and all that. It was not um, as it is now mm -hmm. that you think, oh, one day maybe I'll be... Uh, an advocate or whatnot. Mm -hmm. It was really for the people. And mm -hmm. in fact, the only reward you were likely to get apart from jail was to be killed. Mm -hmm. And we were prepared for that. We were literally 100% prepared uh, to die for this country. And that's why it's so sad to see people that you know had that spirit yeah. now selling out completely and pretending not to know these mm. things, pretending not to know what we were fighting for either because they want positions or they want money yeah. or they want all sorts of um, uh, advantages for mm -hmm. for for, for, the sem for yeah. themselves personally. It's better when people are ignorant. Yeah. But when they know that what they are doing is wrong, yeah. which half of the people in the ANC know that um, the, the current ANC is the biggest enemy of black people. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if the the if if it continues to be in power, then we'll be prolonging. So we'll be multiplying. Apartheid was mm. in in power for about forty two years, and we cannot afford to have another uh, neo apartheid under the ANC mm -hmm. for another forty two years. Mm. So, I think thirty years is enough, mm -hmm. and that's why we're going all out to ask people to register to vote to make sure that. Um, the ANC is, is taken out of, of power. Yeah. <clears throat> because 30 years is, is, is more than enough. So if you're a revolutionary, you must be prepared really for any consequences. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't expect, you know, that's what the president of the EFF always says, you can't expect, ask people to do that which you are not prepared to do. Okay. Um, so you must be prepared to, to make the sacrifices whether it's your family time, whether it's your, your own, sometimes even your own health. Sometimes you go to a meeting knowing that you're not feeling well, mm -hmm. uh, but you've given yourself to, 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 to the cause. Yeah. And it looks easy, you know, and nice on television. So if people see, for example, the president of the EFF currently is going around the whole country addressing uh, Ground Forces forums. Yeah. You know, it looks all glamorous. That's hard work, I can tell it you. It is. Yeah. It that's is. Oh, Most of that, you, you don't even feel like waking up, you know, or the children want this and so on. But mm -hmm. you have to focus on the task at hand. And um, so, you know, and, and that's, that's what it has always been. Your generation of the 40s, Nelson Mandela... Uh, Oliver Tambo, these were lawyers. They could have just said, oh, well, we'll just, we know there's apartheid. We're just going mm -hmm. to sit here and make a, a bit of money. Well, yeah. We are fine. Yeah. Um, but they didn't. Um, one went to exile for mm -hmm. you know, decades. The other one went to jail for decades. Yeah. But 
it was not it was because of that sense of selflessness mm -hmm. and the people as i say were always behind if they were if the people on the ground were not behind the the those leaders mm -hmm. then they would have died or, or, or rotted in jail yeah which is what gets for, forgotten mm -hmm. uh, you know that successive white governments mm -hmm. voted for Nelson Mandela to be kept in, in, in jail for our people to be kept in, in exile and now they want they are the ones who want to teach us mm -hmm. uh, about nonviolence yeah. tolerance and so on the things that uh, they could yeah. not uh, give out to us mm -hmm. all they gave us was torture uh, imprisonment forced removals and misery mm -hmm. and chris honey believed Uh, in socialism and believe that socialism is about uh, obviously delivering basic service delivery like water like housing shelter to the people what do you think would be the reasons behind the failures of the ruling party to implement the ideas of one of their own i mean it was the SACP mm. uh, leader which is in alliance with the ANC yeah no the, the ANC has always been a liberal uh, organization It was, mm -hmm. of course, radicalized, uh, particularly in its era in exile, um, by the infusion of uh, socialist ideas. Mm -hmm. But it, the NC itself has never embraced uh, those ideas. I think the highest it ever went was the, in the Freedom Charter, mm -hmm. um, which in itself is, is not a, a distinctively socialist uh, document. Mm -hmm. um, but the... the uh, uh, Other revolutionaries such as Chris Hani, who believed wholeheartedly in uh, equality, uh, naturally had to be thrown into socialism because socialism is represents a society where inequality literally becomes the enemy. Mm -hmm. Inequality of classes, the inequality of uh, genders, and 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 so on. Mm -hmm. So um, it is. It is um, a, a, an ideal which we have to fight for. Understanding that you cannot have, you can't just switch a light and have socialism tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, neither can you have socialism in one country. It, it, it has to be an internationalist movement. Yes. But it has to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so each one in our own countries have to make sure that those ideas permeate into, into society. So collective ownership mm -hmm. Socialism is actually uh, closest to us as Africans yes. because we always were a collectivist uh, society mm -hmm. in, in general. So if you take two extremes, collectivism is a broad category and individualism. Mm -hmm. Africans, that's why we talk about Ubuntu, 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 and so on. All those things are ideas of a collectivist society. Mm -hmm. So it's almost natural for us to care for the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, socialism is probably the closest uh, ideology that would resonate with an, an honest African uh, of, of, of who we are. Yeah. The other thing about individualism, each one for himself and all that, yeah. is something that was imported into our culture mm -hmm. uh, from the West, as it were. Uh, it's, it's not naturally us. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, the, the Christianities of this world mm -hmm. uh, represented that spirit of, of, of yeah. collectivism. That's why we talk about nationalization of the land, nationalization of the minerals. Because why would minerals be um, used to benefit a few people, mm -hmm. and mostly foreigners, mm -hmm. when, when they are here, and uh, to actually impoverish mm -hmm. the people of the, of, of the land? Land. Why would land be owned individually instead of by all of us collectively, as we own the air and the grass and all the and the and the forests yes. and so on? Um, so the I, I believe that uh, any human being deep down is is a should if if they are really human should 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 tend towards collectivism and caring for the next person than selfishness that yeah. is associated with capitalism. So is that the reason why you left the ANC and joined the EFF in 2013? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I when I left the ANC, uh, by the way, I, I always, as I say, was skeptical about whether the ANC is the real instrument <laughs> <laughs> for, yeah, for, for change. change. Yeah. But, um, and in fact, one day when I write a book, I'll, I'll even tell you about, so there's an effort that we even made in the 90s um, with Corporate Winnie and others where yeah. we thought uh, maybe we should have a plan B because this thing might be captured completely, yeah. which uh, actually happened, yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the when I left the ANC, I had analyzed the situation in South Africa and came to the conclusion that the ANC had now crossed the line to becoming the enemy mm-hmm. of true freedom. Mm-hmm. And the best hope Mm-hmm. For that not to happen was the leadership that came from the ANC Youth League in 2011, mm-hmm. which came up with, in their 24th conf, uh, Congress, came up with um, a program of action mm-hmm. that included the land expropriation without compensation, nationalization mm-hmm. of mines, free education, and all those issues. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly... Uh, that's a story I'll tell you some other day. <laughs> yeah. Once that leadership was put in place, within mm-hmm. a month they were charged by the ANC okay. and persecuted and then finally expelled. I represented them in the disciplinary uh, hearing. So I could see exactly, maybe more than any other person, that this was a political kangaroo court which was meant to liquidate not just these individuals but the ideas that they stood for. Mm-hmm. So... Once that happened, when the the EFF was formed, for me it was a, a natural thing to do. Okay. Because um, I, I I wrote an article which explained the the why I did that. It was headed, I did not leave the ANC. The ANC left me, mm-hmm. and I explained there that the liquidation of the EFF Youth League uh, leadership, the Marikana massacre and the adoption of the so-called National Development Plan by the ANC were mm-hmm. for me the last straw, and I knew that the future lied elsewhere. Yeah. And actually, it was the job of every uh, self-respecting revolutionary to make sure that the ANC is brought to its knees, mm. particularly the current ANC, which is known as the ANC of Ramaphosa. That one is not, <laughs> it's not even the ANC. Yeah. It's just a, a, yeah. a liberal uh, club mm-hmm. of... Uh, sell out mm-hmm. and uh, to the people who might say you're being personal against Ramaphosa what would you say because I mean the writing is on the wall there are quite a lot of cases that Ramaphosa Marikana is one mm. what would you say to those people yeah no I don't mind if they look at it as personal it's fine I mean it's it's uh, the uh, it's the same way that I would be personal against PW Bota and Fervurt mm-hmm. or anyone who stands in b- between uh the the us and the liberation of our people, so it's not it's not about an individual as such. At a personal level, I relate to him like any other person, mm-hmm. but uh, it's what he symbolizes. Just like I, I also I even relate to Stenis and when I meet. Oh him, yeah, oh yeah, I remember him. in the funeral in KZ yes. and you you were shaking we're ch- hands yeah, and, and yeah, yeah yeah yeah. Now I talk to, to yeah. those people. Oh, at the funeral of Mangosu, Prince yes, Mangosu. Yeah, yes, yeah. At a human level, that's a different. Even Helen Zile, you know, mm-hmm. when I meet with her, we, you know, we joke around. She likes. Uh, showing off that she can speak his thoughts. <laughs> yeah. That. That's fine. Mm-hmm. It's 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 not personal like that. But it's also personal in the sense that it's my people and me who are being uh, uh, oppressed by these people. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm I'm you know I'm not about explaining it. It's not about the individual per se, mm-hmm. but what they symbolize. Anybody who's a traitor, a sellout or a collaborator is uh, I'm personally against that person, yeah. Mm-hmm. And anyone who's a leader of p- traitors and sellouts, yeah. uh, I'm even more personally against them. Yeah. But as I say, not at the human mm-hmm. um, man-to-man or man-to-man yeah. yeah. level, yeah. No, it's not like that. Yeah. Uh, it's about a political program. When we sing about Bota and Forster and mm. Fairwood, it's... Individually, I'm sure there, there might be nice guys at home who you know wash the dishes and all. Yeah. That. But uh, it's what they symbolize yeah. uh, that we're up against, and um, 
Yeah. We have to fight and destroy them politically. Yeah. The same way kill the boor, kill the farmer uh, as chant is not personal. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's why you know political slogans cannot be taken literally. Mm -hmm. What must we say now? We, we always said we we're fighting against the boors. Now we must uh, change our <laughs> our, our, our language. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the now you get ANC people saying we must not say okay, kill the boar, kill the the farmer, and then at the funeral, at the funerals they sing the Ambaga Shem Konto, Tina Banbum Konto Sis Misele, Ugu Abulala, Wana Amabun. So yeah, the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing, but it's fine to say it in, in Zulu. Mm -hmm. But you mustn't say it in English mm, yeah. and say boa because the white people will hear you. Mm. That's a ridiculous cowardice. No, no, no. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of, 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 of small distractions that, um, mm -hmm. um, and I think our people understand that. I mean, if, if we, ours was about killing anyone, uh, mm -hmm. it would be the easiest thing to do. The, uh, the, why would we choose the arduous and painful way of uh, conversing people calling meetings asking them yeah. to register it's and so an on ah, it's, yeah. it's the most difficult yeah. thing to do i mean yeah. yeah if we could just simply just go and and kill someone mm -hmm. we do that because we we understand that the political space that was created in 1994 can now be utilized to fight the enemy politically so when we say political uh, freedom is meaningless without economic freedom. We don't mean that the political freedom meant nothing. I would be the last one to say that. Because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be, if if it was before 1994, if I sat here and said the things I'm saying to you, I would end up in jail. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate the political space that is uh, has been created. Mm -hmm. But we're saying it was not the end. Ours was not a struggle to vote. It was to vote so that we can attain economic power. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the fundamental mistake of the ANC. They thought we just wanted to vote and then rest at the halfway station and then that's the end. Mm -hmm. No, the halfway station was there so that we can get to the real destination. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the difference between us and them. In 2014, you were elected as the national chairperson of the EFF. Uh, talk us through that historic moment. Yes, well, it, it, it's something that we, all of us would always be proud of, to have been elected in the top six or in the CCT of the first ever mm -hmm. uh, elected um, uh, leadership of the EFF. Uh, something that makes all of us uh, proud. Um, because we believe, as I say, that we have built here something that is mm -hmm. unstoppable, mm -hmm. uh, that will deliver the liberation of our people. So it's a proud moment, but it was also a difficult moment. You know, it's easy now to glamorize it, but uh, to start an organization from nothing. Yeah. Uh, all of us in the uh, uh, EFF leadership always say that if we are ever asked to do that again, start a new party, yeah, we'll not, say no yeah. thanks. Uh, I'd rather go home and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. let, let the enemy <laughs> to, to, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to do whatever thing. it wants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Um but um, I must say that uh, yeah, under the leadership of of, of the current president yes. uh, and 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 the collective leadership that he leads, he's a very determined uh, person. Okay. You know, um, I like his style of leadership mm -hmm. because you can see beyond. Uh, what other leaders might see. So, oh, it's got the giraffe view. Yeah, the, what you call the, gi <laughs> the giraffe view, yeah. yeah. Um, and there are moments one day I'll give you stories, yeah. personal stories about sure. some of the things that he did, <laughs> which made me to know for a fact that mm -hmm. here we have a leader who's going to deliver our people. Yeah. Uh, in very difficult moments, uh, him and I were always arguing and differing. Yeah, like this yeah, and the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are people who think, who say that the EFF is a cult movement. Oh, yeah. And they say, no, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Mm -hmm. If they could see us uh, uh, debating issues, yeah. They'll be surprised. Yeah. Um, this internal democracy. Yeah, the, the internal democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I say, you know, I say to people, people who have organizations that campaign with a big face of their leaders, we campaign with a, our t-shirts don't have a face of anybody, mm -hmm. but uh, we are the ones who are called uh, 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 the cult movement. Yeah. But the enemy always will find ways 
to you know to label you Mandela was a terrorist and yeah. uh, Tambo was the devil. You know there was even pictures of him with horns mm -hmm. uh, in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, in him, I think uh, the, the 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 future of this country is very safe, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 so the, that first leadership, you know, we hope that the current leadership is finding things easier. I mean, we were in some rented space in Grandfontein. Look at you now; you are in a in a building <laughs> yeah. that uh, that is owned by the by the sure, EFF. Yeah. So the next leadership must also build on that. The next leadership must get a whole town, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> to to yeah. to be uh, to 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 belong to the EFF. Yeah. So it it was a proud moment. But as I say, building an organization, anyone who has ever built an organization will tell you. Yeah. In this country, which is so big. It's the one of the most difficult uh, things to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we had uh, one day. I'm sure some of us will write books later about uh, some of the of the of the issues that we had to face. Yeah. But um, the EFF is uh, you know it, is a tool of the people. It doesn't mm -hmm. belong to us. Mm -hmm. We were just uh, soldiers who were, who were building it up, not for ourselves. But as I say, as an instrument, as a weapon, more accurately, mm -hmm. a weapon in the hands of our people mm -hmm. to deliver economic freedom and complete the project that was started in colonial times. Yeah. And uh, most people, well, some would say uh, the CIC is a dictator. Mm -hmm. Would you say the same? No. He's, <laughs> that guy is just a puppy. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. he's not a dictator at all. Okay, yeah. He's, um, you know, the the a listening leader. Mm -hmm. um, so in his nature, for example, I, I would come with an idea to him and he said, no, oh, come to that. In fact, when he wants to differ with me, he calls me Buddhal. Okay. And I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going no, to have disagreements here. Yeah, yeah. No, Buddhal, we can't, we can't do this here. Mm -hmm. So he uses Buddhal either as a, a to, for differing or as mm -hmm. a, a a term of an endearment. Mm -hmm. So whenever he speaks, I must work out which Buddhal is this. Okay. Is this the one yeah. of being nice Keep or quiet. the one of saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so you, you, you will say, no, 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 mm -hmm. we, we can't do this and then whatever, mm -hmm. and we'll debate it. Two days later, it he, will be the first one, even in a meeting situation, by the way, because mm -hmm. it's just a, an open book here. Mm -hmm. He'll say, hey, no, I was wrong. Uh, somebody said this to me or mm -hmm. whatever, and I took this position. Yeah. I think, actually, that's the best position. Yeah. Or call you and you debate it further. Why did you say this? Yeah. yeah. That's the kind of leader you need. Not someone who thinks that you have mm -hmm. all the answers, because none of us have all the answers. Yeah. Uh, he believes so much in collective leadership. You know, when we were, in 2016, when they were hung parliaments in, 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 in the metros in, mm -hmm. in, in, for the first time, yeah. he did something that uh, all of us didn't even think of. He said, yeah. he called a meeting of the CCT and said, let's all vote as to whether should we partner with the ANC or with oh, the yes. DA. Yeah, yeah, I remember It that. was a secret yeah. ballot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And none of us know whatever happened. Yeah. He, looked at because he was busy searching for whatever what would be the best political solution mm -hmm. uh, at that time and at that time we believe we took the right decision yeah um so those are some of the anecdotes that would show you a, a dictator would never do anything like that mm -hmm. or take the matter back or even accept defeat so yeah. many times we defeated him yeah. in, in the CCT. Yeah. But he had an idea. We said, no, that's not yeah. going to happen. And uh, he throws his toys and that's yeah. it. And sure. Like all of us, if we put an idea which you think is the most brilliant and then you get defeated, you then you yeah. say, well, oh, one day. You see. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad you have de uh, demystified the, the, the myth mm -hmm. uh, for the viewers as well. Now mm -hmm. they can see and hear for themselves. Yeah. And we saw you over the weekend in Kulu. Mm -hmm. Weekend Lake Kulu, you were uh, flanked, uh, you were in fact with the commander in chief during a voter registration mm -hmm. um what what impressions are you getting uh, what are people saying about that yeah no i was very it was very i have a very soft spot for uh, mm -hmm. Malema, by the way because as i say as i, I think politically is probably the most astute uh, political leader i've ever mm -hmm. had to work with and um and committed and prepared to sacrifice mm -hmm. the time of his family and 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 so on 
Um, so when he asked me to accompany him this weekend for the voter registration, it was a, it was a pleasure to do. I mm -hmm. actually had said to him, no, I'll only do half of Saturday. I ended up doing <laughs> oh, yeah. both, both, both <laughs> days. Yeah. yeah. It was great, actually, mm -hmm. to see our people committed and coming, especially young people, to register. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the most important observation for me in the two days, we went, uh, we went with the president, we went to something like 12 stations, maybe six uh, yes. on each day. Mm -hmm. And something that I, was a takeaway for me was the fact that, you know, there was a time when the EFF was said to be a male macho yeah. organization. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, not only have we do we have a, a top six that is now fifty percent um, women, mm -hmm. but on the ground, I think um, uh, I know you were there. You will remember that in maybe in eight of those twelve stations, mm -hmm. the people who were at the table were women. Yes, and yes, most of the time, of them, yeah. so most of the time, two or three women, hundred percent women, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was a great thing for me to to observe yeah. because I started observing it uh, because uh, you know w women the majority of of members being mm -hmm. women or of leaders or people at that level mm -hmm. augurs well for the future yeah. because uh, women activists are very uh, tenacious and reliable sure and uh, the fact that the image of the EFF is now um, that. That, that it's almost natural. You don't mm -hmm. even think about the fact that you find four women uh, being in charge of a, a particular EFF yeah. uh, station. Yeah. So I, I, I think it was great, uh, even from that point of view, mm -hmm. apart from the fact that women voters are in the majority. So yes. it's a good way. To no, it's a good uh, a sign ahead of the 2024 elections. And talking about the 2024 elections, uh, from the legal uh, system point of view, mm -hmm. What sort of changes would you want to see under the EFF government? You would know the EFF uh, is calling for an open border. Mm. And um, this has, like, in fact, has caused, caused fears. Mm. A lot of people are saying, no, we're not going to vote for the EFF because they're going to open borders. Uh, we're glad and honored to have you yes. to demystify some of these uh, myths. And how are we going to go about um, this open border policy in when we take government in 2024 yes i think that <clears throat> the issue of immigration mm -hmm. is obviously a big issue internationally mm -hmm. uh, in every country and i think that the eff stance on this is is completely misunderstood again deliberately because our, our detractors you know want to to paint us in a particular way mm -hmm. our stance is very simple we are Africans before anything else. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a position that is a progressive uh, pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the same people who say, the, who, who don't understand that they are Africans, will say, because um, it's Africa. Mm -hmm. They don't say it's South Africa. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, Others belong to an organization called the African National Congress, not yeah. the South African National Congress. Mm -hmm. Because in our character, we've always been Africans. These borders were imposed upon us, not for our benefit, for the benefit of Europeans. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, it, they were, the, the whole continent was divided up in Europe at a conference in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, According to this one, will go to the Portuguese, this one will go to the English, this one will go to the French. One, yeah. no. So the borders are defined by others, not by us. Mm -hmm. Now, the borders are there, they are a reality. Mm -hmm. So when the EFF talks about uh, One Africa, it's not like something that's going to happen next year. Yes. It might take 50 years, it might take even 100 years to achieve. Okay. Because the reality is that the borders are there right now. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, let's have a mentality of integration, of integrating the the uh, the continent, African continent, yeah, yes. into an economic block, so that we can then develop the continent. Now, people say, no, 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 we can't. We're fine with these borders, mm -hmm. um, but that's um, that mentality is backward. Why do you think the United States of America has fifty-one states, uh, you know, different states? but united. Mm -hmm. 
they could have fed 51 countries mm -hmm. like we do. Why do you think the EU, the European Union, decided to have a European Union? Um, you know, but we cannot have an African you, uh, Union. Yeah. It's something that we have to do over time, obviously, gradually taking mm -hmm. into account the realities. Mm -hmm. You can't just switch it on mm -hmm. a switch it off. So that's what we mean. So you have to start, for example, by integration at the SADC level mm -hmm. uh, and okay. then the other blocks, ECOWAS and so on. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in another 20 years, you can take another step. You start saying, okay, let's abolish visas. In another 20 years, you can say, let's do this and so on. But the direction must be towards African unity, mm -hmm. uh, not towards uh, our own little homelands. Uh, it's almost like we want the homeland system yeah, to come back. The next thing we'll say, okay, we want these borders now. Now we want uh, the provinces to be, to be, and then now we want the metros yeah. uh, and, and, and until. Yeah. But the point is that Think of, of it like this. If you're unemployed, would you rather have your chances of getting employment in a country, one country with 50 billion people, or be able to operate in a market with a billion people? Mm -hmm. If you're selling T-shirts, would you rather sell them in a in your village or sell them in a in the city, or sell them in the country, or sell them in a in a in a continent, yeah. and have a bigger market. So that's what we should be thinking the about. Sort of yeah. a global integration, absolutely. Yeah. And and the economic muscle. Yeah. I, imagine if you say you produce something, some shoes or whatever, mm -hmm. and now you have a billion people in Africa. If they said no, we're not going to buy that shoe of yours because maybe you are doing child labor and so mm -hmm. on. You will certainly uh, listen up more than if it was uh, just Kenya or Mauritius that was saying that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's what we mean by collective power. The collective power of ourselves as Africans mm -hmm. must be used to better uh, our lot. Mm -hmm. We have a one, we have a, a billion and more India, people in India, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in China, in America and so on. And we want to compete as little uh, enclaves. Yeah. So that's the that's the, really the vision. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's one Africa in that sense. It doesn't literally mean that I'm going to wake up now tomorrow and and, and have a, a, mm -hmm. a, a place in yeah. Cairo if yeah. I don't want to work there. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, this is about uh, broadening, broadening our horizons and making sure that we are able to trade uh, in the continent freely, this free trade as well. So I think uh, that will help and allay the fears yes. uh, on the side of the voters. Uh, 26 point uh, eight million voters have been uh, registered uh, over the weekend. Uh, South Africa has 62 million. million popul the population is 62 million. 26.8 million, is, is that enough or do you think we still need more voters? No, remember the 62 million includes everyone, yeah. children with under the voting age and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, no, we can never have enough. I personally am against this thing about registration. I actually think that it should be automatic mm -hmm. that if you are 18 and above, uh, you should um, qualify to vote. Maybe you should be allocated a voting mm -hmm. station and so on. Why is it that we don't have to register to be in SARS? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, yeah. We, we, yeah. So uh, some of these things just happen uh, automatically. But uh, the system as it is now, I think that the registration mm -hmm. is, is, is an indicator. It actually helps us mm -hmm. to know, for example, we now know that out of so many registered people, so many vote. Mm -hmm. That means that's a signal that shows you that there is this level of apathy. Mm -hmm. Or maybe let's not call it even apathy, but people who are disgruntled with the system. Mm -hmm. And therefore it guides even the campaigning because you know we can target those people who don't vote. Yeah. But um, the most worrying trend is, is, is young people. Well, I'm glad that in this round yeah. we're told that more than 70%, almost 80% yeah. of the people who yeah. registered were young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the future belongs to young people. And um, the future was always changed by young people. In the 40s, the young generation of Mandela were in their 20s yeah. in, the, in, the, in the 40s. Uh, you know, in the 76 generation, 
our generation of the uh, young lions in the 80s and now this generation of 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 the EFF uh, leadership yeah. and um the uh, EFF student command those are the people who should be because the future belongs to them mm -hmm. they are the ones who are going to be here in 50 60 years yes. time yeah. when all of us will be yeah. Young. yeah yeah advocate uh, dalimpo for we need a day and yeah, a half for absolutely. this <laughs> we have to we'll leave it there right. <laughs> for today yeah. thank you very much uh, for coming through uh here on our state of the art uh, studios and joining us on this exciting uh, conversation on the eff podcast we really hope to have you next time thank you and vote eff don't make a mistake yeah you have had it <laughs> so thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for watching we have come to the end of today's episode of the eff podcast remember to subscribe uh, to the channel of the EFF uh, on YouTube uh, for more on the EFF uh, podcast. My name is Titus Tungu. Until we meet again, good day, you can get. Can mamba. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.